welcome everyone who's taken the time today to come to this session. Uh, I'm based here in Mumbai, India, so a very good evening to you from here, but I know you are in different parts of the world, so whichever time of the day it is, I hope you're having a good time. I understand it's late in the day, you've gone through many sessions, and that's why the focus of my presentation is going to be more bringing my classroom alive. So everything that you've heard from all the amazing speakers, you know, who've been sharing their learning with you, I thought it would be great to see all of that come to life. I believe that the uh, journey of a language acquisition teacher is never easy because they are dealing with so many different levels, so many different children at all uh, points of time, you know, in their journey as an MYP teacher. So that's going to be the focus of our conversation today, where we look at, you know, what came to life through all those units in my classroom and how the criteria and performance tasks were embedded. Not just the large performance tasks, but also the smaller ones, you know, which you need in a language classroom, because I believe every student is actually operating at a different level. And I'm sure you understand my challenge if you are a teacher of language acquisition. I also want to um, put out there that, you know, I teach a language which unfortunately does not enjoy very high status in India. So it's been a lot of learning for me as to how do I make it very, very interesting and engaging. And that's why you see that beautiful painting by, you know, uh, an artist here in India who does um, Devnagri calligraphy, which is the script that I also teach. It takes a lot of energy and effort to get the students excited, motivated, and also sustain that motivation. So I hope that you will be able to take away and make what you want from this journey. You know, there there are many, many examples. And of course, in no way can they be replicated because we all operate in a different context. Every language operates in a different context. So please feel free, you know, and make what you want of what I'm sharing today. I'm going to just talk a little bit about my journey as an educator. I've been a language acquisition specialist for almost 20 years, 21 years now. 10 years of these in all the three programs of the IB. I've been very fortunate to be working with the school for over 10 years now. So I've had the chance to experience the PYP. Then we opened the MYP. And of course, now I head the diploma program, but I'm also the language program coordinator for the school. Very often I'm in both uh, Hindi and Spanish language classes. That's the ones we offer at school. And I'm also a TOK teacher. I believe language is power. I've seen that come to life in the diploma program when suddenly there's this realization as to how language is such an integral part of your identity. I'm very, very uh, passionate about project-based learning. So you see a lot of action in our classroom. You, you see a lot of hands-on, minds-on experiences. I use a lot of other subjects to bring language to life. That's how we make language learning interesting. So you will see a lot of art, a lot of music. I also um, love to incorporate research that is taking place in the field of educational neuroscience into the classroom. And you will see examples of that, you know, that I'm going in what I'm going to present today. I believe I'm a learner. I think where I stand just now and after having, you know, gone through all those amazing presentations starting this morning, you know, you feel like there is so much that I don't know. You know, you know so much, but you still don't know so much. So I believe you learn all the time. And I think especially for the MYP, it's really, really time that we share our learning because that's the only way we can all learn and grow. We all understand it's a very flexible framework that can be interpreted in so many different ways. So I think just learning from each other will take us a long way. And every you don't have to reinvent the wheel, you know, every time for certain things. I believe teachers are brain changers. I think you make a contribution to the lives of your students every single day. So we'd be very, very proud of yourself. Sometimes we don't sit down and actually give ourselves, you know, that um, appreciation that is required. So thank you for doing that. And of course, I'm here to share and learn and we'll begin our journey with that. I just wanted to very briefly um, say thank you to a few people. I think without my students and fellow educators, like all of you, I'd be nowhere. They are the ones who inspire me every single day. Uh, I've just listed some people, you know, whose learnings I draw from. And as you all know, understanding by design plays a very, very important role. But I've had some life-changing experiences when, for example, I attended a webinar, you know, with Judy Willis, uh, who does research on educational neuroscience and the models they can bring to the classroom. Same with David Souza. I love Guy Claxton's work where he always ends with, this is what I do, now you take it away and do your thing. And the photos that I'm sharing, I have taken permission from my students because they're okay with it. Just, you'll see a lot of color and a lot of photographs. 
Um, just very briefly going through our goals for the day, we are going to try and understand the MYP language acquisition framework. Of course, it's not very, very different from the whole framework. You know that the new guide is out now, you have the phases that have been combined and you understand the levels. That's everything that you can read in the guide. So I'm not going to discuss that too much, but we will be just looking at some nuances of what I picked from there that were eye openers for me. We're also going to uh, be talking about what is performance of understanding because that's what a performance task does. It's kind of showing us what our students understand. It's giving us that evidence. So we'll talk a little bit about the why. Of course, we will do. We will also discuss the how and what, but the how is what you make of it. So, you know, please take it away. And of course, talking, especially from a language acquisition teacher perspective, how do I make this relevant and rigorous, you know, for my students? Because very often, especially where Hindi learning is concerned, and I'm sure there are some other languages in the world, where very often, you know, you have students say, I just need English to survive in this world. Why do, should I be speaking this language? So we're going to address that a little bit and how, you know, we design experiences and tasks that kind of make that important, that realization of why you need to learn that language important. And then of course we have time for some question and answers, but we'll also have time in between. And of course, Nikita will help me moderate those. Okay, as you clearly see, I'm from India. I love food. I think it's the best analogy one can have. You know, every time I'm, working on a unit this is the picture that comes to my mind because we have what we call our masala boxes whenever we cook and you add different ingredients and i'm just here to highlight the ingredients of course that i use when i start thinking about that big idea that comes first and i have heard uh, i heard lenny did uh, lenny talk about it and of course it, it's come up in so many conversations that where does one start and I think India is a land of opportunities. And because we also follow the project-based learning framework and we are a school that's very heavy on design thinking, we start with that big problem. It could be the uh, sustainable development goals. And fortunately in India, we have so many languages, so many states. So it's very easy to identify something that needs to be done. So that's where we start with. And then we start adding all the different spices. Of course, the MYP objectives criteria um, the journey starts there. What do they need to know in terms of knowledge and skills? It's very, very important for language teachers to build an understanding of the progression. And that's where the standards come in. So um, of course there are many, many standards available, but the CEFR and ACTFL are two of the most popular uh, continuums that you can look at. And also if you remember the old guy, there was also the global continuum of languages. We, which we use at our school and it's an excellent resource if you want to place a student or track the progression. Because if a teacher is not aware of the progression in that particular language, in the particular language, it becomes very, very hard to, you know, kind of determine the trajectory of that student. So that's a skill that, you know, you need to be working on all the time. What's new, like ACTFL never had standards for Hindi, but they just released some maybe a year ago. So just keeping yourself up to date with that knowledge progression is very, very helpful. The relevance comes a lot from the global context, the key context, the related concepts, and of course, the inquiry questions. We are not a very recipe school and we are very, very flexible with the way we design our statement of inquiry. As long as the essence is alive, that's what we believe in. So we may not have actually, you know, just place the key concept for the sake of it or the related concept for the sake of it but the entire statement should be breathing what you're working towards, breathing and living that big idea that you're working towards. Also the readers and writers workshop, which we've called, you know, adapted to Hindi plays a very, very important role. So just an ever expanding understanding of that is very, very important in our language acquisition classroom. One of the most important things, and I cannot, you know, state that enough, just knowing your student knowing their backgrounds, knowing their families. And there are many, many ways of doing that. You know, you can start with language portfolios, for example, already in MYP year one, and that language portfolio continues with the student all the way to 10 or even up to the DP. You know, just it's, it's like a journal where the entire journey of the student is in there. And of course, also being in touch with families because that really, really, we need the support. We need them to be living, you know, the same aspirations as us. So that is very, very important. And last but not the least, of course, compassion, empathy, and patience. I think I don't need to talk too much about that. And you all live that in your classroom every single day and are learning and building that capacity every, uh, every single day. Parents sometimes expect us to, you know, uh, of course, the student to learn the language from 
A to Z in no time, but just having explanations and just, you know, knowing the why behind what you do, knowing that knowledge progression in language acquisition is very, very helpful, you know, to kind of keep you well equipped to be able to deal with those questions. So that's the framework. And of course, you choose what you want more of what you want less of depending on where you're heading. So it's as easy as that. I know it's said easy, but of course, it's different for every school and there is no one single recipe because we operate in different contexts with different sets of students. Just to very, very briefly talk about performance and I was looking at various definitions and of course this was a very simple one and I was just contemplating, you know, what is really performance and it's actually action. It's, it's when students do something. And uh, what we very often have discussed in our collaborative meetings is does it always have to be at the end? You know, we've always discussed performance task as that big task at the end, we talk of the grass, but how, how can we scaffold that? Because not every student has the ability to kind of go through maybe all the, you know, uh, grasp indicators. They're all operating at different levels. So we said, why can't smaller tasks also be these, you know, uh, smaller actions and kind of smaller uh, demonstration of understanding. So that's why we picked this definition and, you know, it's the execution of an action. It's when you accomplish something and show something that's a performance task. And we look at um, different examples from the classroom, from the Hindi classroom at our school. <clears throat> this is a slide which may look a little disconnected, but I always add that in. When I started my journey as a language acquisition teacher, and of course you, you get the guide handed on to you, and then you have your uh, all the explanations, you have the from principles to practice, but then you have your objective and criteria. And till very much later, I did not realize that the objectives are actually the seven, eight level of all the criteria, because that's the goal that you're working towards. And by no means is, you know, that is what you can achieve directly. So it's a journey. It needs to be built step by step. It needs to be broken down. So this was one realization that came very late to me. And if you're a teacher, especially who's new to the MYP, for all the guides, this is actually the goal. The objectives are the seven eights, and then we scaffold everything down. Of course, I'm not going to go in the details of that. You have that in the guide. And it's always a nice exercise to actually look at, you know, the different phases and how that criteria becomes more complex. Of course, we have the, uh, we have the new guide now. Um, things have changed. Some have simplified. Some have become slightly more complex. But it's what you make of it. So very, very uh, good exercise to do. If you're new to that, you know, look, go through the criteria and actually mark and see how knowledge is progressing or how language acquisition skills progress. Um, just to talk a little bit now about performances of understanding, as I like to call them, of course, it's performance task, but it's the performance of understanding, really, because we are seeking that evidence through those performances at every single point of time. Very often we talk about activities. This was a switch we had to make at school where it's not about activities that are hands-on. Very often we discuss that it needs to be hands-on. Children need to be doing something, but is it really minds-on? That's the big question. And I think project-based learning has really helped us do that because we actually look at those big ideas or sometimes just inquiry questions and we tune them. So we sit in our meetings, we take that question, and we actually discuss what we want to achieve by just addressing that or designing learning ex experiences connected to that. And sometimes the teacher who has designed that actually takes a back seat and just listens to the conversation that other subject teachers are having related to the question that I have designed. And that gives you a lot of valuable feedback on whether you're really going to get there and also a lot of creative ideas from people. We underestimate the power of those ideas that other subject teachers can give us. Not to forget, Every teacher in every teacher, not just in the MYP, but in the PYP or the DP is a teacher of language. If you're teaching individuals and in society, you're a teacher of that particular subject. You know, you're teaching the vocabulary of that subject. So it's very important to keep that in mind that you are just ensuring what they're going to do. And it's not just something hands-on and crafty that happens very often in a language acquisition classroom, especially because we like to celebrate our festivals and we just land up designing something related to that, but why? So very important, just keep that in mind. You need to give them something to think with. That's what Minds On is all about. Uh, performance of understanding, of course, encourage flexible thinking in unfamiliar situations. You can't expect every student to take away the same understanding. That's something we've struggled with a lot because, you know, when you um, design a statement of inquiry, 
of course we are working towards that goal but that doesn't mean that every single student is going to take away the same thing from that journey of learning especially in language acquisition we've seen that you know very evidently but am i able to apply that even if it's a smaller unfamiliar situation or a bigger just that they are able to take it and you know use it in many different situations that's what we are aiming for also there is a deliberate creation of understanding using information and knowledge as you know our criteria a's are all about that we are actually building that information and knowledge first and then moving on to applying those skills so we are going that journey and we are actually very very intentionally um you know uh, creating those learning opportunities i remember uh, kath murdoch i think was um, saying that there's nothing really uh, unintentional about inquiry so i think we can't leave everything for the students to figure out of course you create the environment for them to be able to ask the right questions uh, have the right discussions and you are facilitating those but there is intentional there is guidance to be able to you know reach where they want to reach um it's also not something that students have especially with language that's very very hard it's something that they should be able to do there is no problem if they have you know the word order let's say got all mixed up but they are still able to communicate and that's the goal of language acquisition so they are able to do that it's very important to keep that in mind uh it's also a quest for teachers to gather evidence of student understanding because we spoke of how we uh think of our end goal that big idea that big question that big statement where we want to get but uh it's the beauty of the task then you know how am i going to know that my student is able to demonstrate that understanding so it's very very important to define that evidence at the beginning and of course there is nothing predefined and you have to tweak it as you go because understanding develops and sometimes you need to change things and i believe that's a plus because if every journey went like we had imagined it would go then there's definitely something wrong but initially defining that i will have option a b c you know as evidence and i know that this is what my students are able to do i just talk, like to talk about one example now like i said that just bringing some stories you know from my classroom to life uh what you see here is a student in the third standard who is just about learning how to make very short sentences by conjugating words so what you see our classroom is very very kind of self directed of course we start we uh, kind of define what the goal of the day is and very often the students are kind of helping themselves they are helping each other and of course the teacher is there to help them and facilitate any discussion that's required but the environment that is created for example i call this a simple mental computation because the student needs to conjugate a word you know grandma in hindi is nani and the student is just trying to define what are the consonants and vowels that we need to pick up as you see we use a lot of other languages to also learn hindi on the right you will see how all the vowels are kind of uh, you know you uh, see the english pronunciation of those particular vowels which helps the children let's say if just the hindi is not working out we also speak english how can we use that language we very often use um tabletop dictionaries as we call them the one on the right you will see has the hindi alphabet it has an image it has the english alphabet uh, and then on the left you will see that you know when students advance then they go on to just the hindi one and the images once they are even more advanced you can also drop the images and we'll see an example of that too so something as small as this is a performance of understanding when a student has been able to figure this out the student has learned the process of getting there it's not just about that final product it's really an understanding and then performing it so because when the student i'll show you what then this leads to and it's just you're increasing the challenge as you know that the student is able to progress to the next level and as you can see it's very very self directed and it's actually very very short it could be a couple of lessons you know to do this and the follow up example that i'm going to show you the same student of course then starts working towards this where you have everything available and again they pick and choose and are able to write short sentences very self directed again they feel very empowered because they know the process this is just adding one layer of complexity as you know that in our criteria especially for language acquisition what increases is the level of complexity sometimes the strand may have exactly the same explanation but what you have changed is the backdrop what you have changed is your source you know your resources are becoming more and more complex so this is a great example of that 
but still a student, you know, performing and just explaining how the understanding works. What goes hand in hand with this is a lot of student conferencing. So you're talking to the student, you're helping them to think, they are asking you clarifying questions, and then that's what you land up with. We don't correct mistakes all the time. That can be very, very demotivating. And very often we do collective, you know, kind of um, kind of mistake uh, addresses. So the teacher, when the teacher is going around, the teacher is actually collecting what, you know, the teacher is observing in terms of mistakes, and it's done collectively without putting any student at the spot. So this would be a time to pause reflect if you have any key takeaways or comments and I'd like to invite Snigda to help me with that. All right, we do while we give everybody a few minutes, uh, Varsha, to think of the, or reflect, uh, we do have a few questions that have come in. Uh, both the questions actually talk about um, the knowledge of progression that big that you had shared and uh, if you could talk a little bit more about you know an example of how if we are somebody who's trying to merge and work with both MYP objectives as as well as say CEFR mm -hmm. or uh, ACTFL how would we you know try and merge those any strategies any tips mm -hmm. uh, that you have Definitely. Uh, Snigda, I'll give you examples of how I have used it, you know, so that, um, you know, people can probably use it. You can do so much with that. Now, the common European framework of reference is, of course, for the European languages. But where it's really, really helped me is that it breaks down language acquisition. You know, even if you're just talking about reading comprehension, how do you break reading comprehension down? So it's actually giving me strategies to, you know, design my tasks, pick it up from there. It's a manual that runs into hundreds and hundreds of pages. But, and, you know, there's no way you're going to implement it like a Bible. But that, that's always your reference point. And also for, uh, for teachers who are familiar with that, internationally, you use the A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, C2 scales, you know, or the levels uh, for language learning. And the MYP actually has based it off that. So if you look at the guide, you will see a reference to these documents. And what these documents actually do is just facilitating that breaking down of skills. So please do. It's a free document available. You know, I, I would be happy to share the link with you, Snigda. It can be added to the slide later when we put it up. And then, of course, you are welcome to download that. And that's my ready reference, you know, in my um, classroom when I'm planning all the time. If you look at some of the strands in the MYP criteria, you will be able to find how you break down even those strands. So that's how it really, really helps. And sometimes you don't find the exact match, like CEFR doesn't have a standard for Hindi, but ACTFL does. And also, uh, especially, let's talk about ACTFL a little bit because they are very recent standards. And you know that Hindi is more anglicized now. So you have a lot of words from English. That's how people normally speak now. So it's also evolving and keeping that alive. You know, it's like people 100 years ago spoke Hindi in a certain way, but we don't need to speak it like this. So that's how these standards really help, you know, kind of keeping up with the times. Absolutely. Uh, we also have another question that's come up from Sneha um, and she's asking specifically, she wants to know how do we create a rubric or how do we ensure the right movement of children from one level to another? Um, good question, um, Sneha. And uh, what we do is we actually use the global continuum of uh, language learning, which is in the IB guide. It's been a very, very helpful document for us. And twice a year, we kind of address that for every student. So we have a file, you know, we make a PDF for every student and we just highlight, you know, they are kind of the entry and exit analysis of the students, as we can call it. So they are very, very helpful. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with VEDA for English. That has been very helpful for us, you know, because there is very restricted material able, uh, you know, available for Hindi. We are not very fortunate uh, teachers. For example, when I see everything that's available for Spanish, you know, and my Hindi teachers always struggling with how do I do this? So we do a lot of adapting. It's, you know, it takes a lot of creativity to create resources, to create rubrics. For example, the PBL Works uh, website has a rubric to create rubrics. So that's the kind of resource sources that you can, you know, uh, use, adapt, and of course, make it work for you. And it's habit, you know, once that's why I feel that this community, especially language acquisition can share so much. Because you know, if you've created something magical, share it, it makes it so much easier for other teachers around the world who may be teaching the same language or a similar language. 
Um, there are a few people who are talking about, um, and I think this is a really good discussion that's happening on chat, but I just wanted to see if you have any inputs on this as well. Uh, so there is a question that says, if you notice that there is a big gap in students' la language ability, how do you effectively address it while continuing to discuss your SOI or your unit, right? Um, and especially if you're not a language acquisition teacher, uh, the one that we have here is like, I'm a math and science educator where English is not the first or primary language. So how do you have any tips being a language acquisition educator? How, how can we go about this? That's a very tricky question. And it really takes some juggling to do in the classroom. You know, it's about how you've designed your learning experiences for the day. Because if you know that there's going to be this one student who is going to need that one on one attention, you could either use another student to help the student out. But then you also want to be thoughtful about that student who needs the stretch. So I would say if there is no one answer. It does take a lot of juggling. It also takes a lot of help. And I think we have a very um, you know, active community. So where if I really, really need an other hand in the class, then of course I'm going to you know, invite that hand, but also setting up one-on-one -on -one times you know, where you can meet with the students, you can give them extra work. Um, uh, very often you know, we have faced situations when the student is learning Hindi and there is no help at home for example, you know, to keep that language alive. So very often parents come to us and say that, you know, my student gets exposure to this only in the classroom. What do I do at home? But of course, you know, if you're living in that environment, fortunately for Hindi, you're living, breathing in the language outdoors. So, you know, you're seeing posters, you're seeing the print, but it's, it's a very tricky situation. And I think it depends on the student and where they stand. Uh, also, if you look at the new guide for an emergent level, you don't need the global context. So, you know, that relieves you of some pressure because first you need to build that knowledge base so that you have something to think with and something to talk about. We also leave debatable questions at that emergent level. There is no way they are going to be able to do that. And just doing that in English is not going to help. So that's how we are also breaking, uh, you know, teaching and learning down. All right, I think we can move on. Uh, Vasha, I, we have a few more questions, but I think we'll take them later on. Yeah, okay. Um, just going to take you through a very quick quiz. If you could just look at these three pictures and just put in the words that come to your mind in the chat. I'll just give you two minutes to do that. All right, I think everybody's thinking about this. <laughs> yeah. All right, just the, the words that come to your mind. Yes. Uh, we yeah. have resources, location, arrival, emotions, life, map, travel, uh -huh. <laughs> maps, emojis, traveling, a lot of traveling coming up. I think it also has- It's to on our minds, <laughs> everything's stuck, <laughs> yes. Um, we have one that says navigate feelings and imagination. Okay location stories of my living space mm -hmm. is what dmck has shared i think that's a good one as well creativity knowledge environment identity feelings these are some of Thank the you. words that are coming so, in. Snigda, i've heard all three that i need to hear <laughs> um and we'll just move on to the projects that we've done you know in our school in the hindi classroom and then you'll see how all of these come to life and then you'll also be able to identify the words that we are talking about. <clears throat> I'm gonna talk a little bit about a project that we did. And I understand that currently we are all tied down at home, at least most of us, you know, Mumbai is in a, a lockdown again, but this is a beautiful example of bringing Hindi learning to life. Um, very often we know our calendar for the year. You know where you're going to head on your trips. You know what outdoor experiences you have planned for your students. And it's a great, great opportunity to actually work your entire teaching and learning around it. This is actually a unit that we took the luxury of doing over four months because we knew that we were going to a beautiful national park. It's Kaziranga in Northeast India, which is very, very rich in art. It's very, very rich in um, food. Uh, it's very rich in weaves and it's very, very rich in wildlife. And also there is a problem that we are facing where there is an island that is shrinking. So when we spoke of those big ideas, when you talk about language, you also talk about sometimes cultures dying out because of the impact of climate change. Now, this was a great opportunity for us to jump in to make Hindi learning relevant because to be able to take action, the students had to understand you know, what people are thinking, what is going on. So what I've just put together is of course, images and resources. And we'll talk about, for example, the brainstorm or the provocation. 
we started with a video on um, this beautiful island, island of Marjali, which is shrinking because of you know the floodwaters in Assam. And what is happening as a result of that is that the earth or the mud that is available for the craftsmen there to create masks is not available anymore. Now this is impacting lives, this is impacting migration, and it's just was an opportunity for students to realize this is happening so close to home. We also wanted them to know that, uh, you know, because very often students in the MYP are engaged in services action, and we talk about different countries, but the beauty is in starting small, the beauty is starting in your own country. And what better way of addressing the problems that are actually closer to you before, you know, talking about all the big problems that are existent and that are actually connected to what you are doing in your own country. So we started off that journey with that. And of course, you know, we were building knowledge about that particular region. We were talking about food. We were talking about animals. You can just imagine that that base building was so, so solid, but had direction. There was always excitement because they knew they were going to go on the trip. I currently understand that we are in challenging circumstances, but hopefully everything will be fine one day and we'll be able to do this again. What we were doing alongside, you know, parallelly, if you look at the left, we were creating, we were using technology and created infographics. We face a lot of uh, challenges, you know, students don't want to write. You know, it's bring technology in, bring design in, and that's what makes it engaging for them. They loved the project. As they were going along, they were having discussions. They were interviewing people from that region. We had actually tied up with the local organization. If you look at the top right, was a woman who has a little sustainable village of her own where they weave, they collect plastic from the entire region. And what you see is actually weaving plastic thread into table mats. Uh, they learned about the food of that region and also how sustainably they are living, how they grow their own food, how they eat what they grow. So the context was very, very authentic. The criteria is intertwined in a way that they don't even realize that they're addressing the criteria. And I think that's the best way to address it. It shouldn't be about we're doing criteria A strand three. That's something we don't use at our school at all. Um, there's also ongoing reflection because you know whatever their experiences are so well connected that they feed off each other. There is so much voice and choice. If you see that they can design the infographic using whatever app, they can hand sketch, you see some of that. They can hand write, they can type it out. So all of that is completely up to them. They're also constantly uh, getting feedback from their peers. They are working on their ATLs, presentation skills. Some of them were group projects where they are actually working on a weaving project by interviewing you know, and learning the art of weaving. And of course, finally, there was a public product and presentation. So we invited our school community, we invite parents because that raises the bar for them. They know that we have to exhibit it to a larger audience and that's how we kind of weave in the nuances of project-based learning. So this is an, a beautiful project that came to life really well and students never forget this. Ultimately you want, like we use that terminology very often, you want your curriculum to be sticky. It needs to stick with the students and this allows you to do that. So beautiful example of what, to, uh, what worked well. Of course, every unit is a journey of learning and you know that you know what you could do differently each time. But any trip allows for this. And that is why um, also if you look at research in educational neuroscience, they talk about just connecting learning to a place. And that is very, very important. These are our students who will never forget this journey of learning. They never forget this trip. And what we came back with is that they were, you know, like simultaneous bilinguals because they were switching between English and Hindi without any hesitation and with so much ease because that's what they got used to. That was the only language they could communicate in with that community. So it was a very, very authentic context for them to operate in. So that was the first one. So if you put the word place, destination, that's what it's about. Just connecting your learning to that to make it relevant and of course also rigorous. <clears throat> Just a very, very brief pause. If you could think maybe of some ways in which you make your learning relevant or any key takeaways or comments. <clears throat> All right, we'll give everybody a few seconds to think about this. So what are some ways in which you make re learning relevant? Um, real life applications mm -hmm. is one that's come in. Real life resources. Yes. We did have a lot of love coming in for actual project, pro project and problem-based learning, mm -hmm. connected to their lives, connect units to real life. So making a lot of real life connections, having real audiences, um, bringing in authentic texts and real stories. Um, I think just 
you know, triggering that emotional connect, mm -hmm. um, using their interests, uh, taking the language out of the classroom and yes. getting students to make those connections outside, role plays, um, helping them understand the skills they are learning uh, and that they are transferable. Um, we also have some people sharing that, uh, yeah, publishing, writing, speaking to communities, just taking students out of the classroom and getting them to immerse in experiences. I hear a very important word um, you're repeating, Snigda, life and language is about life. You're communicating about this different aspects of life. So if you're able to make those authentic connections with life, then that's how you can be successful. And it takes a lot, you know, like you spoke of resources to design um, relevant resources is very, very tough. And that's why I'm always, you know, um, thankful that we have people like Raphael, for example, who are thinking in that direction and, you know, creating material that you don't need to just adopt, but adapt. You know, you can actually take an English acquisition uh, unit plan that has worked well for somebody and see what you can do with that. Sigda, you also lead me into the next one very well, actually, because if there is life, then there is, of course, emotion. And I want to talk about another story or another journey of learning um, in this unit. And it came from um, questions asked by students. So, you know, I've been listening to the sessions before. Uh, mine and you know we were wondering about how does that big idea come about and sometimes that big idea comes from students I have not included one project because uh, here but I want to talk a little bit about it and Snigda mentioned publishing and I actually had a um, sixth grade student you know I think even younger when I was teaching the PYP where the student said uh, miss I don't want to look at Hindi books because they don't look good they don't feel good and uh, I just asked the students so what should we be doing and then the students said well let's make one of our own and we actually did that we we had our students create a book on Hindi alliterations because they were actually at that starting point learning the alphabet we called the art teacher in we also had uh, the math teacher in, you know, for price points. And, you know, we also had, the, uh, we had different art from different regions. So the art teacher actually arranged workshops for students to, you know, bring their sentences to life through different forms of art. So questions and big ideas can come from students as well. This one too, you know, where the students, and these are students, of course, in grade nine, who feel very disconnected and they think only English speaking is very cool. And how are we going to change that? So we actually started this with, why do we need to keep Hindi alive or why do we need to keep any language alive? And it was a wonderful uh, unit which started with just discussing identity. What does that mean? When I go out into the real world, what defines me? So starting with questions like that. I wanted to use a lot of material, you know, because we have, we are very blessed with Bollywood, but that can also become, uh, it's not a blessing sometimes because it's considered very cheesy by students. But I had to show them the rele relevance of songs and, you know, what they contain and the messages they can, they can kind of uh, bring across because we have a wealth of Hindi songs, but the students don't listen to them. So what we did is not take the Bollywood version, but we took a version that was sung by the University of Berkeley. They have a, a whole department dedicated to one of our music composers and suddenly it was a light bulb moment for them that people abroad are actually studying music from India and, you know, creating versions of that song. So what are we doing about it? And these are the things that, you know, touch the emotion. And I remember Snigta mentioned the word emotion because life is emotion. So when you touch those chords, that's when they start thinking. And we actually worked towards a debate, which was like a performance task at the end, but there was a variety of mini performance tasks along the journey. As I said, again, writing is always tricky for us to get there. So you see an example of a sketch note, you know, what you started with, what do you think with it? Uh, when we were listening to the songs, we were actually talking about senses and how you feel a language. How do you use all your different senses to feel it? Can you hear it? Can you touch it? So, you know, just listening to the songs, then gradually adding visuals, then making meaning of the word, then making meaning of the concept. So all the layers were built in and of course, uh, one piece was the debate and the other piece was an actual performance in a school assembly where they narrated self-written poems in their own languages because you get a lot of realization of identity and that's the whole purpose of the MYP. This international mindedness, what my identity is and again leading to simultaneous multilinguals I would say because we have students who speak German, Hindi, English, we have students who speak Gujarati, Hindi, English, seeing all of that come to life. 
and actually narration of poems we had on stage of course accompanied by you know the performing arts so again a lot of opportunity for interdisciplinary units a lot of opportunity for them to see the beauty of art and culture that comes with language so again another example of an excellent unit and i um, love this photograph because when we actually started feeling words feeling language we actually had a student you know who is one of those who did not find hindi learning important actually cry so you see when it touches your heart it actually sticks with you so again coming from educational neuroscience if you bring emotion in to your classroom there is no textbook that can bring this emotion in it has to be designed by the teacher who is very passionate you know with the team that is constantly inspiring you with students that are constantly inspiring you and they they kind of they start coming up with those big ideas and make your life a lot lot easier you don't have to look for them and of course they are all phase 4 students you know very very capable of uh, discussing so you you know we raise the bar in the debates there is more complexity of language the vocabulary they are requiring the structures they are requiring to debate are more complex again adapting from P, uh, pbl we had um, you know we invited judges for the debate it was a whole formal setup we invited parents and the rest of the school so again that raises the bar of quality they also worked on speech writing because of course it was a debate so how do you analyze what makes for an impactful speech so you can imagine all the teaching and learning and the mini performance tasks and of course the big performance tasks that you know went into this project it felt like another win and that's why i thought i'd use this example just to share with all of you last but not the least very very important and i'm so glad that we'll have um, catherine burger k um, talk to us soon because she's truly an inspiration like i said stories of people this story just started with um you know our facilities and we were working uh, the person just came in we had an electricity out that day and uh, we had uh, one of our facilities come into the classroom and you know the children were working on something and just say it would be nice to have something that's actually not connected to electricity you know and what do we do about that because they live in small homes in mumbai where this is a you know continuous problem so you said great opportunity let's see what's happening in the world of renewable energy again starting from a problem so it instantly makes you know um things close to you it just happens you know that you are touching somebody's life so uh, we designed this unit actually around building houses we wanted them to communicate with local carpenters now local carpenters in mumbai only speak hindi a great opportunity for them to you know use gestures or you know use simple language or use complex language as you know that you'll have students at all levels it was an excellent idu with mathematics and science because in mathematics they were studying angles and you know it allows you to study you know how solar in science they were of course studying cells you can the convex concave i'm not a science expert but my teacher could talk about science in more detail but so beautifully coming together and actually this you know my classroom looked like a workshop it didn't look like a classroom they came into the class and they knew what they had to do and i was just weaving in you know so to say the language goals again an authentic audience they presented the t-shirts if you look at the t-shirt at the back of uh, you know the girl on the right bottom it says soch badlo which means change your thinking it's you know uh, adapt that growth mindset so this is again a display of what stories can do when somebody narrates a story you know that story sticks with you so service learning especially for language it's a great opportunity because everything that you offer to the student where somebody is being supported and somebody is being helped then it sticks with them you know they connect with that and they want to do something about that and they never make a face about you know any aspect of that journey of language learning uh just in relation to that one more example where we actually had a group of girls in one of the slum areas of mumbai and they were a very very brave bunch of girls whom our students connected with and they wanted to install solar lights you know in their community because uh, the toilet they visited was about a kilometer away from where they lived and th there was no electricity there and there was no lights there so they always uh, used to hold back on eating they used to hold back on actually using the toilet and our students worked with them in collecting funds in raising awareness working with the local police working with local uh, suppliers of solar electricity and of course this was featured in the newspaper in mumbai so again just the connection to stories when they connect with the story of someone you know you can bring language acquisition to life and really really feel connected 
again, coming from um, educational neuroscience, I've of course just introduced three aspects, but if you are interested in reading, please do research that and see what you can do and bring it to your classroom. It really, really makes your classroom come to life. Great, this is what I had to say. Of course, I can go on forever. There are many stories to tell, but I hope that uh, you are able to take away nuances or whatever you want and make of you know, um, my experiences, which have been very, very enriching. No journey is easy. Every unit has you know, its challenges, but there is so much to learn and there's so much to refine and relearn. Thank you. Perfect. If you have any questions for Varsha, please keep adding them to the Q&A box. Um, I am going to start with one, which I think is going to lead us into another story, hopefully. No <laughs> but problem. we do have a question where uh, Paolo has asked, do you have a vertical curriculum for MYP 1 to MYP 5, or do you do cycles of units? Um, and they're asking this, especially thinking about finding ways to get students in phase one um, to collaborate and work together with students who are in other phases and maybe then lead to a deeper level of learning. Mm -hmm. um, so have you ever tried something like this in your classroom? If so, how did it go? Um, uh, Snigda, actually, we have tried various things. Like I said, we are also a school that's relatively, uh, you know, new to the IB continuum. So we just have our DP1 this year and we'll be going uh, into the DP2 next year. So you can imagine where we stand just now and we are in the process of aligning this. Uh, the tricky bit is that a language acquisition curriculum requires, a, it requires alignment on the one hand, but the journey of every student is so different that you actually chart out that journey for a particular student. But like I said, that's where the CEFR skills have really, really helped us because language acquisition is actually not related to age. You have a phase one student coming to you in grade six and you also may have a phrase one student coming to you in grade eight, maybe. So what do you do then? You know, when we were much smaller in terms of class numbers, we've also tried combining classes where, you know, you divide your classes based on phase rather than age so that they have more students to communicate with. So that would be one strategy. But other than that, it's these documents and also the continuum of languages in the IB um, guide, it's not in the new one, it's in the old one, you know, but I know that document is also available as a PDF in the resources on my IB. So that's what you could use to align it. Of course, now that we have the DP, what is helping us do better is because you have the five themes in the IB DP, we are kind of taking that and breaking it down, you know, to the MYP and then of course, further down to the PYP. But in the PYP, we don't want to make it, you know, over organized because that's when they are just about figuring their way out. And if we, especially with Hindi, if it becomes, you know, uh, like a language and with too many systems, then they are just so put off. So we also don't want to do that. We want to keep that joy alive. So, you know, that's what we try and balance. So I, I don't know if I've answered your question, but it just takes a lot of different things to do. No, absolutely. Um, and I think with response to this question, we did have a little bit of conversation going on in chat with people who did try this and how it went for them. So um, I think this question was partially answered there as Wonderful. well. Um, there is a question by Drew. Um, I feel I do well developing tasks that relate to the SOI, but I have a hard time getting the students to connect to the SOI and the concepts. Do you have any tips? Uh, Snigda, again, a very tricky question. It's very hard for phase one students, you know, to be able to directly connect. But if you look at, um, I'll give you a small example of identity, for example, and a statement of inquiry related to that. And I would like to attribute this to, of course, Raphael's work when we were discussing about identity, for example, and how do you introduce that to somebody who's just begun language learning, who doesn't even have the words. And, you know, he um, very promptly said, you know, you could just use the passport. And start, you know, by that, you just take an image of that and start talking about, you know, what the student is seeing. That's where the multimodality comes in. You see, there's a lot of stress on that in the new guide. So what are we doing with visuals? So that's how you would start and lead to those bigger understandings. And sometimes, you know, uh, it's, that's why we also said that we don't go into debatable questions at all. Also, when you design your inquiry questions, you know, that's your opportunity to scaffold. So you have multiple inquiry questions where let's say a phase two student who is slightly, you know, more advanced may not be, uh, you know, addressing some inquiry questions. 
but then you have some other students you know who are addressing those scaffolded inquiry questions so you can play around with inquiry questions there and you know then of course that will lead to you designing tasks that are scaffolded too so that would be you know like one idea but that's not the only one you know you have creative teachers who've done a lot of work and uh, of course you just start playing with it and you get better at it Absolutely. Uh, thank you for sharing that, Varsha. We have a question uh, that Nithi has asked, um, and I think this has to do with the context of virtual learning and, uh, you know, getting students to find these hooks and these projects virtually. Mm -hmm. So could you share a little bit about how that's gone for you or what modifications have you made in your teaching uh, to give them similar experiences, if not the same? Okay, I would be lying if I would say that it's all been very easy. It's been very, very hard because you don't get to do, you don't get your hands and your mind out there together. I think what we have, uh, there are of course a lot of videos available, articles available, but uh, here I would like, the, uh, like to stress on the importance of guest speakers. I think especially where language acquisition is concerned, if you're able to bring in speakers in where you know the students are not always listening to the teacher voice, which you know eventually becomes so monotonous online, or if you're able to collaborate with other schools, because a lot of times, you know, we realize that we have low numbers for Hindi. And, you know, of course, our Spanish, we never face a challenge with. But for Hindi, we have three students. You know, we could collaborate across schools, for example, to be doing things together. Or, um, uh, you know, uh, there is, of course, I don't know if you know Mural, but we've been using a lot of that. It's an excellent application. If you've not explored it so far, please do, because it allows you to upload resources, type, collaborate, and just work magic. So I think we've just been more innovative there as to how we can use all the apps available, you know, and kind of make uh, teaching and learning interesting. But there is burnout. Zoom burnout is a reality. And, you know, we, of course, also give them breaks then, you know, where you're not, you're doing something independently and and then just bringing that back uh, to the classroom. Absolutely. I think we have time for one more question and I'm going to take this because this is a like a big umbrella question and I think a lot of new educators who are doing this for the first time uh, would really benefit from this. Uh, but Nidhi also asked, what are the suggestions that you have for a new teacher who's teaching for the first time uh, in the MYP? Uh, what are like your top three tips for um, new teachers? <laughs> um, my one tip would be that, you know, there is no end to reading the guide. You read the guide, you read it again, you read it again. I'm already in the second phase of, you know, where um, I was on the MYP language acquisition review team. And I realized how important it is to just read. You know, very often I get teachers who are not willing to do that. So I would say that just read. I also would say reach out. There is always somebody in your school because the MYP framework is the is a similar one, you know. So reach out, feel free to ask questions. Don't just sit with all your questions with you. And I do hope that other schools have an environment like we do, you know, where it's totally okay, you know, to go and just sit in a class. Lenny spoke about, you know, the what was that, the pineapple uh, piece, you know, where you actually can put up uh, what you're doing in different classes so that you know teachers know okay they are just going to be doing a provocation now how does a provocation work so communication keeping those you know uh, channels of communication open and just reaching out, reaching out and asking questions and last uh, but not the least i would say is don't be afraid to make mistakes you know we say that to students all the time and there is no way you're going to get it right I feel, you know, when teachers ask me this question at school and I, and they told me, yes, but you can do that now. I said, I'm in my fifth year and I still struggle with it. It takes a year just to understand the vocabulary. So give yourself that time. Then, you know, you start experimenting with it and then you start to fly. So it's a journey and it's, you know, it takes time. So give yourself that time. So those would be my top three. Wise words, Varsha. <laughs> <laughs> After a lot of mistakes and learning from them. <laughs> well, it's time for me to thank you, Varsha. Thank you so much for coming thank here, you. sharing all of your learning with us today. Um, there has been a lot of love and uh, sharing of ideas and collaboration that's happened in the chat box. And I think it's all because of you, you made it possible. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us, uh, joining Varsha, joining me here today. It was a great conversation. We have a 60 minute break now, but after that, please do join us at 2.30 p.m. GMT for our next session on designing authentic 
interdisciplinary unit. So I think like a lot of ideas from this session can be brought up there uh, for all of you wondering how you can actually design engaging relevant units. Don't miss out on that one. Um, but back to you, Varsha. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was such a pleasure, Snigda. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Take care.